And joining us now on the debate from Winston-Salem, North Carolina, Eric Wilson, author of Against Happiness. In studio, Siri Grell, who writes for the Globe and Mail, and Ulrich Schimmack, a professor of psychology at the University of Toronto, and still with us from San Francisco, California, there's Jane McGonigal. Okay, welcome everybody to the program. Nice to have you all along. We're going to consider the current state of the smile for starters here. <laughs> and Uli, why don't you get us started? I need a nice definition of positive psychology. Shoot. All right. Uh, positive psychology started about 10 years ago in psychology as a movement that uh, noticed that a lot of psychological research often focused on the negative, depression, stereotyping, prejudice. And the idea was that we're missing out on studying and helping people to be positive. Now, this doesn't just include happiness, but also virtuous life, uh, a good life, character strengths. So it's not just limited to making people happier, but it's clearly part of it. And why is there a particular interest in this? Why is it emerging right now? Well, I think uh, this can be traced back to uh, uh, decades in, in um, the social sciences that uh, in the 1950s, 1960s, people really thought, we need to understand this a bit better because some of the old recipes have worked quite well. We have more affluent societies, stable societies, peaceful societies, free societies, all these things that are important for happiness. But clearly, not everybody is smiling all the time, unless they had some Botox. So <laughs> the question is really, what else can we do to really maximize happiness? OK, Eric, let me bring you in here. One of the biggest names in positive psychology is a fellow named Martin Seligman. And he says there is an epidemic of depression. Do you agree with him? Well, certainly depression is a serious problem in America and throughout the world and should be treated any way that it can be treated. What I worry about in my book is the possibility that what was once normal natural sadness is now being categorized as depression. Um, and if indeed that is the case, then maybe a normal part of uh, human experience uh, might be treated as a sickness or a weirdness and therefore it's kind of marginalized and, and uh, almost demonized in our culture in some cases. Now, you've written a book called against happiness, which begs the question, Eric, what's your problem with happiness? Well, what happiness as I define it in my book, and I, and I really focus on what I call American happiness, um, is happiness as a desire for contentment, for tra tranquility, for material comfort. And my fear is if people spend their lives searching only for happiness at the expense of sadness, that can lead to a rather attenuated existence, um, something of a half-life. My feeling is that sadness, or as I call it, melancholy, um, is an integral part of the human experience and indeed often when we're melancholy we pine for a deeper richer relationship to the world around us to the people around us to the world around us and that often leads us to find potentialities in ourselves we never would have found if we were simply content and oftentimes it does spur us to see the world in a new way and to try to be in the world in a new way and hence it can often lead to creativity. Siri it occurs to me that, that uh, you know before we go much further we should probably try to define what happiness is it seems like a concept everybody is familiar with but it probably means a different thing to to different people mm -hmm. you got a definition you like I don't know, couch, uh, some bacon, a uh, good movie. That's probably my definition. That's pretty simple. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm easily entertained. You, you yeah. want to put a little flesh on that bone, Uli? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, um, happiness is something different for everybody. Yeah. And uh, so Always really with bacon, though. the most <laughs> general definition would be that it's a good life that is good for you from your own perspective. Okay, from your bacon's not good for you, so if, you've you got to change your definition, I think. <laughs> well, if she wants it, it's good for her. No. And if somebody wants to spend eight hours gaming online, and that's really what they want, and if they look to their life and they want to look back on all the achievements they had in this online virtual world, then by some definitions, that would be happiness. Jane, do you think that the gaming world that you are so prominent a, a fixture in is really bringing happiness, as defined here, to many more people? Yeah, well, I mean, when I define happiness, I think of it as being engaged with the world. And I do believe that for people who aren't able to be engaged by the real world, these virtual worlds offer them a way to be engaged socially or intellectually or economically. Um, and so they are serving as this kind of virtual happiness um, that, that, is, that is good, although I, I would like to see us take the lessons of how to make people happy in virtual worlds and in games and extend it back into reality so they can also have real world happiness too. Is that, is that the point of your games? Just, just to sort of mm -hmm. ask you a question. Is, is that the desire that these people will try and solve a problem like you know, oil in, in the virtual world and then take that into their, their, their real life endeavors? Right, I mean, it's, it's actually, it's a lot bigger and simpler than that. 
Um, I believe that when you play these games, if they're designed well enough, you get to learn about your own strengths. Um, you know, as Uli mentioned, your own character strengths. What are you good at? What makes you excited? And what you have to give to the world. And you can do that in the game world, and then you can do it in the real world. It's kind of like a training ground for being a hero, being a superhero. And, and people can take that back to their real lives and ultimately be happier in their real lives because of these things that they got to learn and practice in the games. Sarah, you've written about this stuff. Do we I seem would, to be wonder, unhappier? A... Hang on one second, Eric. Do we seem to be unhappier sure. nowadays than we were a generation ago? I think, uh, you know, I, I agree with Eric a little bit. I think there's a tendency to over-categorize everything. And so, you know, problems... I, when I was in university, you know, I had friends who were, who were diagnosed as, as, you know, having depression. And I would listen to their problems. I'm like, you're 20, you don't know what to do with your life and you just broke up with your boyfriend. You have the same problems as me and you know every girl in the world, and, and yet you're being prescribed things. So I think there is an over-tendency um, to take very serious problems and project them onto ourselves. Um, but, and I also think there's a, there's a growing sense of entitlement. We think that we should be happy every moment of the day, and I think that's, uh, that's a big problem. We don't uh, accept the fact that there are going to be you know, some days that aren't so Downtown. much fun. Yeah. Eric first, and then Uli. Well, my fear is this um, overemphasis on happiness, especially in America. It grows from a desire to smooth the rough spots out of life, to, to ignore the darker, brooding sides of life. And I would just ask Jane if, if she feels that perhaps in, in living too much in a virtual world, uh, one will have, uh, one will lose a sense of, of real tragedy, of, of real roughness, yeah. um, because the stakes are, are all virtual. And I wonder if uh. that might ultimately lead people to have a kind of skewed sense of of the world and to take kind of a flight from reality, which as you know is a kind of jostling mix of, of joy and sorrow and, and can be a, a pretty risky, dangerous place. Yeah, I mean, I, let me tell you about one of the games that I've made that I'm proudest of. And, and this might make some of you cringe, but um, I partnered with a video game company to make a game that you could play in real world cemeteries. Um, and the idea was that in America, we have this really weird relationship to death and our cemeteries are not places that we spend time um, and we try to shut out those ideas of, of death and, and the bigger picture of what it means to be human and live and die, um, which is not something that really happens in other countries as much. And so I made a game that you could come with lots of people and play um, in a cemetery. It was called Tombstone Hold'em and it was like Texas Hold'em, but you used tombstones instead of playing cards. And I ran these in cemeteries all over the country and um, I am incredibly proud of what this game did in giving people an opportunity to inhabit a space that is traditionally scary and we feel like we don't know what to do there, we can't have a social experience there. And uh, the feedback was amazing. People were able to take a space of grieving and experience it as such, but also to have a positive experience of it that helped them grapple with that serious stuff. So people there's a find lot that more going. Disrespectful? No, I mean, you'd have to see photos and videos of the game, but we partnered with the boards of directors of the cemeteries, and um, it was a beautiful thing. People, it involved reading the stones, caring for them, you know, brushing off leaves and dirt so you could read the face and see the names of the people and, and th their lives and the inscriptions. And, you know, yes, it was kind of fun and playful and um, a little bit rowdier than you would normally see in a cemetery. But people also sit around and talked about people they knew who had loved and who had died and they told stories and it was, it was this kind of ritual that we're lacking in America. And I think what these games are doing for people now in terms of generating happiness, a lot of it has to do with giving people social rituals that they lack. And we can put these games in serious contexts like a cemetery and give people a way to have, have this ritual and grapple with the big and the meaningful. Um, and I, I'm really proud of having done that actually.